meeting with us tonight, that your spirit is here. Fill us and guide us and keep us focused upon you, Lord Jesus, because you're worthy of all praise. You're worthy of us just dwelling upon your word, meditating upon who you are, what your word says. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We can come before the throne, your throne, and worship you, Lord. And we praise and honor you, Lord. In Jesus, thank you. In Jesus' name.
A thousand generations falling down in worship to sing a song of ages to the land. And all who've gone before us and all who will believe will sing a song of ages to the land. Your name is the highest, your name is the greatest, your name stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all powers and position, your name stands above them all, and the angels cry. All creation cries, oh, holy, you are lifted high, oh, holy, holy forever. If you've been forgiven, and if you've been redeemed, Sing a song forever to the land. If you walk in freedom, and if you bear his name, to sing a song forever to the land. We'll sing a song forever and amen, and the angels cry. Oh, holy, and the creation's cry. Oh, holy, you are lifted high. Oh, holy, holy forever. Hear the people.
Jesus.
I just want to set our eyes on you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. to see
opens the eyes of my heart We want to see you, Lord So much distraction in this world But we want to see you, Lord want to see the true and living God. But we want our eyes to be open, our heart, the eyes of our hearts to be open, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Hallelujah. Lord, I thank you and praise you, Lord. Thank you for this time of study, Lord. Thank you, Lord for being our God, a holy God, who we praise and hold dear. Lord, you died for us. Help us to live for you. As we get into your word, Lord, let your word just hit us. Let your word just get into our hearts. Open the eyes of our hearts, Lord. We thank you, praise you, honor you. In Jesus' precious holy name, amen. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Calvary Chapel. <clears throat> Forgive me for my voice. I've lost it and by the grace of God, we'll get through it tonight. Let's open in prayer. Father, again, it is because of you, because of your son, Jesus, that we're here tonight, that people are watching online and will watch online because we want to know more about you. Those things that are pleasing, those things that are important to you. And we ask tonight that your Holy Spirit would lead us in all truth. Open up the eyes that we might see your word, the living word, Jesus Christ, that we would walk in that straight and narrow path that leads to life. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn with me to Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6. We're going to look at verses 16 through 19. Now, I know it's a right turn. We finished last week the Song of Solomon. And next week we start the book of Isaiah. And I thought it seemed to be fitting. God was putting this on my, my heart just to teach this passage. Now, I've named it the Seven things that are abomination to God. And sometimes we don't want to think about those things. Years ago, there was someone in the fellowship, and I was teaching, and I forget exactly how I said it, but we should hate the things that God hates. And after, after the service, a person comes up and says, God is love and God doesn't hate. No, God hates sin that destroys people. And this is what we're going to look at, seven things that are abomination to God. Now, let me read our text. It's in chapter 6, verse 16 through 19. There are, notice, six things which the Lord hates. Yes, seven which are abomination to him. A haughty eyes, lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, and feet that run rapidly to evil, a false witness who utters lies, and the one who spreads strife among his brothers. See, pleasing God should probably be at the very top of our list of everything, that we want to please him, we want to honor him, we know that what God has done for us, Jesus Christ went to the cross and he died for us while we were in our worst he paid the price. He died once for all, and he was raised from the grave, showing that that sacrifice was accepted and that we should no longer live in sin. And the things that are important to God should be important to us. So pleasing God should be more important than pleasing ourselves. Isn't that really the big problem? We want to satisfy ourselves. We're more concerned with our comfort, 
Especially when somebody hurts us, we want to wrong them. We want to even the score. But that's not God's way, is it? We're going to see those things that God hates. Now, wisdom, remember the book of Proverbs is, it focuses on wisdom. And we know the wisdom of God is Jesus Christ. And these things picture Jesus Christ, the all-wise God. So wisdom lists six things that are abomination to the Lord. But he goes on and he says there's seven that are abomination. Six things he hates, but again, seven that's an abomination. This means something that is, is more than just morally disgusting. It's as bad as it can get. This is at the, the top of the list of all the things. It's not exhaustive list. This is important to understand. But these things are so horrible that he takes the time, the Holy Spirit, to put it in the scripture. Now the word abomination, again, it, it means a lot of things to a lot of people. But these things that are abomination to God will receive those who practice such things habitually. And this is important to understand, will receive divine judgment. And they're really headed that way. They are choosing to be judged. Those who advocate, those who embrace these things, they are an abomination to God as, as well. Our text lists some of the sins, but again, I want to remind you, it's very important, um, it, these are not the only sins. They're considered just the worst of sins. Now, I want to list those sins, and then we'll look at our text. And in verse 17, the haughty eyes, it really speaks of pride. A proud look is what it has. God, is, God opposes the pride of man. Pride is abomination to God. It's at the top of the list. It debunks, again, the, the self-esteem philosophy embraced by so many in this world. And then there's the lying tongue in verse 17. A dishonest car salesman is not one of God's favorite people. Again, there are car salesmen that are honest, but there are those that will lie about the car that they're selling. And they don't care what the consequences are. All they care about is the sale. You know, some people, they don't have enough teeth to lie through. They just, from one lie to another, and they just believe, they start believing the lies that they're saying. And God says, this is at the top of his list, a lying tongue. And so many within the body of Christ believe it's okay to lie. Well, it's just a, a little white lie. No, there are no lies that are pleasing to God. There are no circumstances that a lie is appropriate, even during the time of the Holocaust or war that you're lying. No, when you're lying, and even if you think you're doing it for the right things, you're not trusting in God. You're taking things into your own hands. Say, God, I, I can get this one. I can't do these things because it won't work, Lord. I know. And they're rebelling against God. Now, another thing that I want to say is oftentimes people say, how close or how far can I go and still get to heaven? How many lies can I do? Or how close can I get to that line where God still accepts me? Well, a believer should not want to do anything that disgusts God, anything that he calls abomination, anything they call sin, because sin, our iniquity, is what separates us from God. It destroys the relationship with God. It destroys the relationship with others. Well, the next thing he says, it's also in verse 17, that, that they shed innocent blood. You know, for some people, um, they have this habit in their day, of uh, again, of just um, shedding innocent blood. He's talking about murder. People that are totally innocent. And they plot, they kill. They love to kill. They love violence. They're looking for a time just to go and kill somebody, take advantage, and they laugh about it. And we call them crazy. Well, maybe they are crazy. But it's like a dog who goes mad and gets a taste of blood, and you can't stop them. And once they get that, that feeling of killing, they just go on and kill and kill and kill. And notice it says innocent blood. People that don't deserve it. People have had, they, they thought it was fun to 
to hit somebody, a hit and run and kill somebody, and they thought that's okay. They like the thrill of it, not getting caught. And there's the plotting of it. It's in verse 18, a heart that devised wicked plans. All their evil thoughts are condemned here, especially, think about this, the thoughts that plot to do evil. I'm reminded again in Genesis when they continually thought on evil. Look around. People are just constantly thinking on evil. What can I get away with? Who can I take advantage? Who can I cheat? And then there's this, it may seem odd, but it's a, a passion. Passion can be good and passion can be bad. But there's this, this passion to, for, for their feet to run toward evil. They long to, to do evil things. The strong passion for evil demonstrates again by their zeal, their evil, and shows that they're condemned by God. You'll know them by their fruit. Well, that's our, our love, our actions, but you also recognize them in the world. Some people are not happy unless they're taking advantage of somebody, plotting, stealing a business. I've known some people recently that their friends have turned against them just to take advantage. And you maybe had that happen to you. But this is the way of the world. The world is spiraling out of control and it's going to get worse. It's also in verse 19 we see the word, the phrase of false witness. That's like one you might think that's in a courtroom. You know, somebody who lies, it's like a lying tongue. But they lie about something. I was there, I saw. Sometimes for money. Sometimes just for evil purposes. You see these people in church. They say one thing and then they turn around and they say something evil again. And these people again, they're, they're all over. And it's abomination to God. I can't say that enough. It's abomination to God. But, but we try to justify it. We try and explain it. it it's, it's okay. Because the people were evil. The people deserved it. No matter what anybody else does in this world, we have to do what's right that honors and brings glory to God. It doesn't mean we're a doormat. But it doesn't mean we're going to overpower somebody. We're going to lie. We're going to cheat. We're going to steal. People say, well, the, the end justifies the means. It never does unless you're in the devil's court. That's the devil's way, not God's way. Well, then you have in verse 19, you have the perturber. He that soweth discord among the, the brethren, the one that brings division, the one that tries to draw people away, one that leaves a church for various reasons and then tries to get everybody to follow or, or that person also can lie because they don't want to be honest about it. Their feelings were hurt or they don't agree with something. But they divide. Oftentimes they gossip and talk about people. That's wrong. That's sin. See, these things oftentimes are coupled together. These are the things that God calls abomination. And for us, we should see it as abomination to God. Well, it's interesting that these things God definitely hates as we see in the scripture. It's God's hate list. And there are many more things as you're reading through the Bible, God makes it very clear. And this isn't the first time that God has ever stated that he hates something. But see, people sometimes hold God is love and everything is wonderful. But God hates those things that will destroy you. Those things that separate you from your family and friends. Well, again, in verse 16, notice what it says again. There are six things which the Lord hates. Yes, seven which are abomination to him. This was called, and by many different people, again, Israel's seven deadly sins. Deadly, because if you practice such things, habitually do these things, you can find these things in those, what we call the deeds of the flesh in Galatians. Those who practice such things will not enter the kingdom of God. 
will not inherit the kingdom of God. It'll separate you from God. Anything that is abomination to the Lord that is extremely offensive to him, violating that is his rituals that he had for, again, in the Old Testament, the legal, the moral order, again, these things are setting the people up for judgment. These things, those who practice this thing, are revealing that they don't know God, and, and these are people that we should be praying for, that they would come to their senses, that they would have this broken and contrite heart. They would confess and repent and, and get right with God, but if they don't, they will end up in hell. Now, six and seven is a, a pattern you'll find through the, the Scripture. It's used many times. Six is a, a picture of man when it's used, again, symbolically. Seven is always a picture of complete. And in this sense, six things, he's speaking, these are things driven by man. And God hates the fruit of man from the flesh. Seven, he's saying, look, this is giving you a complete picture. I hate the sins of this world. I hate the things that divide man and hurt other men, and the list goes on of things. God takes a firm stand, and, and he's not going to change his mind. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So again, the, the sequence of these two numbers is used both, again, in, to represent a, a totality. There are so many and God hates sin in its totality. Now, the number seven, again, it's not perfection, as some people say, but it's completion. God will one day deal with sinful man who has not confessed, who has not repented. God will bring complete and total judgment upon the things that he hates those things that are called the things of the flesh. It speaks of the total depravity of a man. Apart from God, we are bent towards sin. Without that mercy and grace of God, there go you, there go I. And this is the point that he's, he's making here. So when the scripture says God hates something, we really need to take heed. God hates any kind of idol, anything that we is in place of him, that we put more emphasis upon that than him. It could be a job, could be a wife, could be a girlfriend, it could be a hobby, it could be anything. God is a jealous God. He wants your heart. He wants to see you walking in that straight and narrow path. He wants you experiencing the fullness of joy that he has for you and me. So an idol he hates, anything that takes his place in our hearts. Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 22, notice what it says. You shall not set up for yourself a sacred pillar which the Lord your God hates. Now again, remember I spoke of this person who says God doesn't hate anything. But read the Bible. The Bible makes it very clear. God hates certain things. See, God hates any kind of idol, anything that would take the place in our hearts. Again, Psalm 45, 7, notice what it says, you have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of joy above your fellows. What does God hate there? He hates wickedness. In Revelation 2, 6, again, Yet this you do have, yet this you do have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate, the deeds, the works. And you're going to see again and again this idea that God hates evil wickedness. Well, the language is exceptionally strong. These items truly disgust God completely. God completely says that he hates these things and we ought to avoid them. This great important truth must never be watered down. I've heard so many people, well, it's not that big a sin. It's not that 
important. No, it is when God says he hates it. I know I'm writing this in the ground, but so often I've heard people, they try to justify their sins. Well, again, Romans 3.18. Notice what it says, there is no fear of God before their eyes. This is why, again, when people want to continue in these things, they have no fear of God. They have no fear in the sense of reverence, but they have no fear that one day they're going to stand before God. They'll face Him in judgment for the decisions, the choices, the actions of this life. Now, again, in verses 17 through 18, when we get there, we're going to see that there's five things involved the body parts, going from the top to the bottom. And in verse 17, notice it's the haughty eyes. It's that proud look. It's kind of like looking down his nose at someone. You know that expression. He's looking down his nose at that person. Pride is the the father of all sin. The proud look is scornful, the Bible says. It's contemptuous. The proud look is scornful again. To look at a person who imagines himself to be better than others. And, and you know, I'm just a servant. I'm just like you. I have my own struggles. I, I'm learning just as you are to walk with God. I'm growing in the love and grace. That's where we start. And to think that I'm better than you or you're better than me. You may not struggle with a particular sin, but someone else may struggle with that one. And we need to understand that, that we're all learning to walk that straight and narrow path and we need to pray for one another and confess our sins to one another. Again, a person with haughty eyes refuses really to drop his gaze. Even out of humility and respect for God that they're walking on holy ground, walking in His presence. I can be good enough. I can save myself. They don't recognize anyone around them that is superior to them. It's number one on God's list. It's put ahead of murder, ahead of drunkenness. God hates a proud look. A proud look has a proud heart that condemns other people, that puts others down and exalts themselves. Did you know that the first overt act of sin was in heaven? The original sin, that was pride. Let me read from Isaiah 14, verse 13 and 14. But you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. This is speaking of Lucifer, Satan. I will raise my throne above the stars of God, and I will sit upon the mount of assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, and I will make myself like the most high. I've known people that think they're so worthy of everything, putting everyone else down and just calling attention to themselves. When you call attention to yourself, you have to put others down. It's in Proverbs chapter 8, verse 13. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. See, when we have that fear of the Lord, that reverence, that respect, but also knowing he's God at the same time, we will hate evil. God Help us to hate the evil and love what is good. Not to condone it, not to accept it. Pride and arrogance in the evil way and the perverted mouth, I hate. Now remember that we hate the sin but love the people. If we lash out at them in anger, how will we ever see those people come to the Lord? It's the kindness of God that leads a person to repentance. We shouldn't lash out. We shouldn't condemn, oh, I'm holier than thou. That's how some people come across. I would never do that. That only pushes people away from Christ. It misrepresents God. And it is also a proud action and a proud attitude. Proverbs 30, verse 13, there is a kind, oh, how lofty are his eyes. His eyelids are raised in arrogance. Be careful. I think we're all guilty at some point in our life of that arrogance. And then in Isaiah 66, verse 2, 
For my hand made all of these things. This All of these things came into being, declares the Lord. But to the one I will look, to him who is humble and contrite in spirit, who trembles at my word. That's what's pleasing to God. The one who's humble, the one who has that, that broken and contrite heart, the one that humbly comes before God, the one who's able to confess his sins, repent of his sins and cries out, God, save me from myself. Create in me a clean heart. So when we look at this haughtiness, this haughtiness is an abomination because it, it implies, again, self ignorance, first of all. It, it speaks of unkindness in reverence to God and to others. Well, the second thing it says in verse 17, is it's, a, it's a lying tongue. A lying tongue is, is a, a deceitful tongue. A tongue that lies is one that totally disregards, distorts the truth. You ever hear of somebody just stretching the truth? Well, that, that's lying. Deceiving people. Why well, God despises this particular sin because he is truth. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There's no way the Father but through him. We should love truth, desire truth. Again, lying totally contradicts the very character of God. In fact, let me take you back to Numbers 23, verse 19. God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. Has he said, will he not do it? Or has he spoken? Will he not make it good? See, God does not lie. You can count on God's word. You know, there were a time that I said, you know, I, I owed somebody some money, and I said, you know, I, I put it in the mail. Well, it was right there in front of me, and I went out to the mailbox, and I put it in the mail, but it wasn't in the mail. That was a simple lie. I, I meant to. I should have simply said, I'm going to put it in the mail. But we lie all the time and don't even recognize it. Have you ever noticed one lie leads to another lie? And pretty soon we don't know the lie from the truth. Because there's been so many lies. John 8, 44, I'm sure you recognize you are of your father, the devil, and you, you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning that does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature. For he is a liar and the father of lies. When a person lies, it's speaking of the nature that inside them, a born-again Christian should not lie. If a person says he's born again and he's a habitual liar, he is deceiving himself. Now, everyone's going to sin. Everyone's going to blow it. But when we recognize it, we confess, we repent, we have that broken heart, and we say, you know what? I, I spoke before thinking. And we're going to do everything we can to make it right. But there are some people who are just habitual liars. And we need to say to God, God, put a watchman at my lips that I do not sin against you, as the scripture says. Because we still have that old man that's still in us, that's, that's struggling. And we're human. Have you ever noticed that there's far more said uh, throughout the Bible about the abuse of the tongue than any other thing. More problems about the tongue than alcohol. More about the, the tongue than, again, all the other problems. This tongue can set a fire, can destroy families, churches, businesses, people's character, people can begin to believe that lie. The tongue was created for communication, but also to glorify God. Whether it's in song or whether it's in word. In Psalm 116, 11, it says, I set in my alarm 
All men are liars. This was David. Are you a liar today? Think about that. We've all lied. And if we've lied, we, we're liars, as the scripture would say. And we have to say, God, help me. Psalm 120, verse 2 says, Deliver my soul, O Lord, from lying lips, from a deceitful tongue. You know, all of us, I bet you in some way, have bought into the lies of this world. The, the world is full of lies. And sometimes we repeat those lies and don't even realize it. So a lying tongue spreads falsehood. It manipulates people, circumstances. It oftentimes hurts and crushes people. To lie is to pervert, again, the truth. Again, is it ever right for a believer to lie? Think about that again. As I read the scripture, it's never right. If Satan is the father of lies, and when he lied, he's speaking of his nature. I'm sick of the old man. The battle is going on. I long to be in heaven. No, not escapism, but just to be everything that God would have me be, and I'm sure you do too. The answer is God cannot lie. He cannot give a privilege to anyone else that is believers to lie. As with pride, sin of lying can first be attributed to Satan. He lied to Eve in the, the Garden of Eden. He actually told her a half-truth. A half-truth is a lie. But a half-truth is, well, it is a whole lie. Because it is a lie, it is a truth, is melt meant to manipulate and deceive people. And Satan is the master of lies and distorting it to accomplish his own purpose. Well, when we think about this, this falsehood, this lying tongue implies we have a wrong heart. Our heart isn't right with God. We can call ourselves Christians all day long, but if we have a habitual lifestyle of lying, we're deceiving ourselves. See, a pure heart supplies no motive ever for a falsehood, for a lie, or for vanity or ambition. No. Falsehood always has a, a bad social tendency. It disappoints the expectations. It shakes confidence. It loosens the, the very foundations of a social order. Oh, that's what lies does. Well, the next thing he calls attention to, it's still in verse 17, is hands that shed innocent blood. Have you ever been in that situation where people just destroy your reputation? Maybe they've taken a life physically. Innocent people, you've done nothing wrong. They crush, they destroy. Why does God despise this particular type of sin? Think of it, because he again, puts great value on human life, on people. There isn't a person in this city that God doesn't put great value on a life. See, he died for every single person in this world, no matter what they're doing. He knew them when they're in their worst, and he died. And how we treat them is very important. And there are innocent people, there are guilty people, but still, we need to do what's right. Well, he puts great value. Why? Again, Leviticus 17, 11 gives us a glimpse. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I've given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is in the blood by the reason of life that makes atonement. The blood in us is the life. God values that life. And in verse 14, the same chapter, for as for a life of all flesh, the blood is identified with its life. Therefore I said to the sons of Israel, you are not to eat the blood of the flesh, for the life of the flesh is its blood, and whoever eats it shall be cut off. God values every human person. As long as they're in this place, there is hope, the hope of heaven. And you and I are to be that light and salt unto the earth. 
And how we respond is very important. Well, in Matthew 27, verses 3 and 4, follow with me. Then when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that he had been condemned, he felt remorse. Returned 30 pieces of silver to the chief priest and elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying, notice, innocent blood. But they said, what is that to us? See to it yourself. Judas betrayed Jesus, innocent blood. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world went to the cross. A lie, a deception. But God used it for good because he died upon the cross and paid the price. Judas only had remorse. There was no confession, really. There was no repentance. Judas bought into the lie of Satan, the son of perdition. Again, oftentimes that's what people do. People that have nothing, done nothing wrong. I think of Israel, what happened in October, October 7th. People just went to a concert, innocent people, struck down, mutilated, raped, carried off into Palestine. People that are full of hate, they'll never really be happy until they destroy Israel, but the fact is we know they won't. See, this is what Satan does. He, he puts his hatred in us to destroy innocent lives. Proverbs 1, 11 says, if they say, come with us and let us lie and wait for blood, let us ambush the innocent without cause. Why is this in the scripture? Because this is how man, the depravity of man is, is bent towards sin. Maybe you don't struggle with it, but there are people out there that struggle. They, they love the thrill of, of getting innocent people and then laughing about it, enjoying it. It's in Genesis 9, 6, whoever sheds man's blood by man, his blood will be shed. For in the image of God, he made man. See, man was made in the image and likeness of God. He has a mind to reason. He has a, emotions. And this is important to understand. And God made man in his image. So he has his moral likeness. He has a mind to reason. He has emotions to love and be like God. But with the fall of man, man became bent towards sin, inherit this sin nature. The institution of capital punishment reflects really God's attitude toward murder. Shed innocent blood. You shed man's blood and, and your blood will be shed. Can you imagine if this is what we really did? Do you think it would stop the murder? I think it would slow it down. So what are we talking about with this one? It's this heartless cruelty. Hands that shed innocent blood. And again, it's, it's an utter lack of sympathy for God's creatures. We're creatures in this one sense. Created by God. And utter lack of sympathy for God. God's mind, the things that are important to him. It shows that they're hardened hearts. And he who inflicts pain is out of sympathy, both in the universe and the maker. It amazes me when I read these things that God would even be mindful of us when we're but dust, as the scripture would say. But God has a hope for you and me. He initiates, he sent his son, and we just simply need to respond to him. He changes our heart, changes us from the inside out. And we need to cry out to him, create in us a clean heart, O oh God. See, in verse 18, it goes on, a heart that devises wicked plants. Again, as I mentioned, Genesis continually thinking on evil, devising, plotting. Proverbs 3.29 says, do not devise harm against your neighbor. 
while he lives securely beside you. See, God says this because this is the heart of man. And please, don't judge others. Take the log out of your eye before you take the speck out of your own eye. Maybe you don't struggle with this, but you've got something else on this top hate list. Every one of us should be confronted in some way. Maybe it's the past, but that capacity is still in you and me until the day he takes us home and he finishes that work. And we should long for that day. We should be sick of ourselves in that way. At the center of the evil person is a heart that really devises these wicked plans. At the cost, the expense of others. This is the course that refers to the mind that's always plotting evil. As I mentioned, Genesis 6, 5, then the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that his every intent of thoughts of his heart was only on evil continually. It's hard to imagine. But look at TV. Look at the rock stars, the movie stars, the life they live, the remarks they say. Look at the politics, the direction it's going. The Lord listed some wicked uh, imaginations. It's in Mark 7, verse 21 and 23. For from within and out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of coveting and wickedness, as well as deceit, and sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All of these evil things proceed from within and defile a man. Years ago, there was a gal in the church, and I just, I just marveled at him. She was a young girl. I never heard her say anything bad about anybody. I go, wow, I want to be like that. And I wanted to encourage her. I, I see that in you, and I love what God's doing. Yeah, I understand that, but you don't know my heart. See, we can have this outward, but our hearts are still wickedly deceitful above all things who can know what the Scripture says. Just because we don't act, just because we don't say, that's good. But we can still have this in our hearts and our minds. Jeremiah 7, 9, as I just mentioned, the heart's more deceitful than all else and desperately sick. Who can understand it? You ever done something, said something, you say, why did I say that? Because there's still evil in our hearts. That old man is there. That battle is going on within us. Proverbs 1.16, for their feet run to evil and they hasten to shed blood. Again and again we see these things in the scripture. But we're, we're more mature. No, the capacity is in you until the day the Lord takes us. Look with me at Proverbs 4.16, for they cannot sleep unless they do evil. And they are robbed of sleep unless they make someone else stumble. Some people, they just like to make somebody stumble and fall. To make somebody's life miserable and they laugh. They plot these things, plan these things. It, it shows again how desperately evil these people are. It almost seems beyond cure. And they are beyond cure apart from Jesus Christ. It's a chronic illness. Again, a con artist whose heart and mind occupy devising these schemes and evil. He will face judgment unless he confess and he repents. Well, this vicious scheming, that's what it is. A heart that devises, again, wicked plans. There's some hearts so bad, they're continually inventing evil things, plotting against people. It's just like before the flood, when God had to destroy it. It reminds us we're in the end, and end times as things get darker and more evil, and it's in verse 18 we see our next point. Feet that run rapidly to evil, Isaiah 59, 7, look with me. It says their feet run to evil 
and they hasten to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity and devastation and destruction are their highways. That's the way of life. That's what they do. It's the way they go. And they love it. See, God hates not only the mind, but the plans of evil. You know, people plan to, to seek revenge, to, to get evil. And, you know, if you think on it, you plan it, you plot it up, eventually you're going to do it. You sow a thought, you will reap an act in the end. And their feet will carry them eagerly to do this evil at some point. See, there are those who are quick to rush to do this evil. And it shows really the depth of their depravity. This person greets any and every opportunity with joyful, even enthusiasm, to do evil. They long for it. They laugh about it in their, their thinking. I think of the Nazis. I don't know if you've watched Holocaust movies or any documentaries. They enjoyed tormenting, starving, beating up. The night of broken glass where they just went through and broke all the windows of the Jewish people. Mocked them, tormented them. And they enjoyed it. Well, again, this motivation is not by tangible benefits so much, but it's the sheer pleasure of wickedness. Some people are just wicked and evil. You know, there's a book written for the minis- those in ministry. It's well-intentioned dragons. You know, people can mean well and, and do and say hurtful things. But there are some people that are just wicked and evil. Wickedness in every area of their life. And why we should not let that tear us down or drag us down. We should move on. We should pray for and say, God, thank you that you sustain me and keep me. And one day we'll never see this again. Never be a part of it. But all again, this evil, their feet run swiftly. Again, they do it eagerly. Why it may be hard for you and me to comprehend It's true in real life there are people just like this. Well, the last two items are in verse 19. They involve two types of people we're going to see. Well, the first one is in verse 19 is the false witness who utters lies. It is not only an uncommon thing today for people to perjure themselves. Again, it's not only an uncommon thing. People do it all the time. Again, it it seems to be one of the most common sins of our time right now. It's a thing, though, that God says he hates. This is important to understand. These last two items, there are two types of people, the false witness who purchase themselves, corrupts justice, and he spreads strife or causes division. Notice it says, among the brothers, among the family, It could be in a congregation. It could be in your family at home. But they're, again, just bring division, strife. Some people are not happy unless there's strife or division or anger or bitterness going on. They're they're not happy. And when a person's in that way, they need to repent. They need to confess and they need to repent. Because where will it stop? Where will it go? It will just keep getting worse and worse and worse. And they fail to realize that in all their joy and all their happiness and all their relief, they're really bitter. They're hurting inside. Like a person who refuses to forgive. They're miserable. And they can't forgive themselves. How sad. Well, this gossip, slander, that's what it is. It's a social curse. He robs his fellow brothers, sisters. 
the greatest treasure, their reputation, lies about them. The church I went to years ago, a girl in the church had some friends come over. She had a, a party, a sleepover party. She accused the girl's father of making moves on her. He was an elder in the church. See, she was wanted to make her father jealous. So she lied about this man. It destroyed his reputation in that church. He so much that everybody believed it that he had to go to another church. And it was like maybe a year later that the girl came clean and says, I just wanted to make my father jealous. He just didn't give me any attention. She destroyed his reputation. But by that time, the man was gone. The family was gone. They suffered. It went all over town. It's so easy to destroy somebody's life. We might misunderstand. We might, all kinds of things can come out of that. God says, I hate these things. They are abomination to me. Again, he says, one who spreads strife among the brethren. Even when that girl, she just wanted to, to get her father's attention. She didn't even realize the destruction, the hurt, the pain that would come. But it was still done. And it was lifelong. Because that pain would linger for years. See, God hates this sin so deeply because... It is the result of Satan's original sin. Satan's rebellion against God resulted in that eternal division in God's kingdom. See, God walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the garden. Sin separated. Shame came in when the sin came. Shame separated them. And Satan was responsible for that division. Well, people with these characteristics like the, the seven are really, what he's saying is these are the, the worst of the troublemakers. He's saying in the Bible, he makes seven of these things that are abomination. This isn't the top of the list. We need to reevaluate. We need like Psalm 139, search our hearts, Lord, and see if there's any wicked way. We really don't want to know the truth about ourselves sometimes. Isn't that true? We, we don't want to accept that, but we need to be honest. It's so easy for man to stir up dissension among the brothers, causing trouble in, in his own private life as well as family and friends. It, it, it's just, it seems as it never ends. It's interesting, this causing divisions with, again, among the brethren with murders, lies, perjures. You, you can, again, murder a person by their character. Oh, not physically. A character be so destroyed. Innocent people have gone to jail, been in prison for things they never did. And even when they've been vindicated, people still look down at them. People still believe the lie. See, disturbing strife, let's say, this spread of strife, division, the person who, again, using tail-bearing, ill-natured stories, wicked inventions produces disruptions, division, and friendship. God abhors these things. He abhors them. We need to pursue peace, unity. Not unity at all costs, but by what the scripture says. We're going to talk Sunday morning about blessed are the peacemakers. What does that mean? But have you ever thought about these seven horrible sins? When you think about Jesus, 
Again, his trial. Huh, what a trial. The accusations that would go against him, the lies. Oh, you're going to see this list. He went to the cross. See, if you have been one of these that have suffered that, you can look at Christ and, and know that we have a sympathetic high priest who knows what it's like to be lied about, crushed about. He understands what no one else understands. Colossians 3.15 Let the peace of Christ rule your hearts to which indeed you are called to one body. Be thankful. What do we need to do? We need to let the peace of Christ rule our hearts. We, will, we won't be going down this path. We'll be avoiding these things. If the peace of Christ rules in our heart, every decision that's made, every action taken will have a quality of peace. Not everyone will be at peace, but you know that you have done the right thing. No matter what anyone else does. Again in Matthew 5, 9, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the sons of God. For one thing, the, the humble are not easily provoked to anger. A peacemaker is one who is humble. They're not troublemakers. No. They don't let these things overwhelm them. But they keep pressing on, pressing into Christ. Although there are those that make trouble for others, their own condition is really far worse. See, since they made themselves object, objects of wrath. See, these are abomination and those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. If a person lives this lifestyle, there are consequences and you choose the consequences. Whether you go to heaven and be with the Lord in eternity or you'll be in hell and miserable because these things themselves they're abomination to God and God must judge because he's holy a rebellious sinful man that will not humble himself before God Father forgive us of our sins Convict us. Convict us in your tender, loving way that you do. That we would confess, we would repent, we would get right with you. Lord, we would not live as the world lives. We would follow you. Wherever you go, wherever you lead, we would learn what it means to deny ourselves and Pick up our cross and follow you daily. Lord, we pray for those that have been crushed, those who have been hurt, those that have been lied about. Father, may they find their comfort in your son, Jesus. May they find peace and comfort with the Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for your word. We look to you to guide us each and every day. In Jesus' name, amen.
He saves our his delight. Christ will hold me fast. Precious in his holy sight. He will hold me fast. He'll not let my soul be lost. His promises shall last. Bought by him at such a cost, he will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. For my Savior loves me so. He will hold. Christ will hold me fast. Justice has been satisfied. He will hold me fast. Raise with him to endless life. He will hold me fast. Till our faith is turned to sight. Thank you, Lord. When he comes at last, he will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. For my Savior loves me so. He will hold me fast. He will hold. Yes, he will hold me fast, for my Savior loves me so. He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. Thank you, Lord. I want to just encourage those that are going through persecution around the world. We, we see your prayer requests come in on Facebook, different places. I want to encourage you, Jesus understands, and we're praying for you in Pakistan and in India, Africa, various places. God hears your prayers. He is enough. He will keep you until that day. Father, watch over our brothers and sisters going through so much. Falsely accused of things they've never done, lied about. People plotting evil against our brothers and sisters. Lord, we don't in this country understand persecution like so many in the other countries. Father, break our hearts where your heart breaks for them that are going through. Lead us and guide us in prayer. Thank you that your word, your spirit can bring comfort to those. Father, may they find encouragement in your word, in your spirit, that one day they will be in your presence. They'll hear those words, good and faithful servant. God bless you guys. Have a wonderful week in the Lord. See you Sunday morning.